Good evening. I'm Jane Buckner. I'm the president of the Benaroya Research Institute at Virginia Mason. And I'm here tonight with my colleague, Adam Lacey Holbert, to talk about the work that Benaroya Research uh, Institute does, and specifically about the work we've been doing over the last year to study COVID-19. So just to give you an overview of what I'll be talking about tonight, first, I wanna tell you about who we are at BRI, what, what we study, and then why we started working on COVID-19. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we've learned about COVID-19 in the last year. So the Benaroy Research Institute has actually been um, studying the immune system for over 30 years. And we're actually located right across the street from Town Hall. So I wish you were all here and you could walk outside and see us. But of course, things are different right now in, in this time. Um, we have over 300 uh, staff uh, at BRI with 200 who are doing the scientific work for us. And as a group, we're all trying to understand the immune system so that we can create a healthy immune system for everyone. So what, we've been, what we do at BRI is we study the immune system in both health and disease. And we're actually world renowned for our study of autoimmune diseases and allergies. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that to give you some background. Even though we're on the corner of 9th and Seneca and we're a relatively small four-story building, we actually are, are an international hub for immune disease research. We have the leadership of TrialNet, which runs major prevention trials for type 1 diabetes, and we also lead the Immune Tolerance Network, an NIH-funded program, to try to keep people tolerant for, um, uh, in the setting of transplant, allergy, and autoimmunity. And the reason I love working there is that we have a culture of collaboration, creativity, and discovery, which I think helps us move our science forward and really make a difference in human health. So our vision is for a healthy immune system for everybody. And the way we do that through our mission is to advance the science to predict, prevent, reverse, and cure diseases of the immune system. And our approach is actually to take basic discoveries in immunology, then take that to studying patient samples, uh, and then to the clinic to do interventions and clinical trials. And then we integrate all of that data through uh, a systems immunology approach. So I like to start by talking about what the immune system does. And I used to really have to spend a lot of time about this and actually explain what an immunologist was. But somehow this year, everybody understands that our immune system is pretty important. And of course, we think of our immune system's role as its importance in fighting infections. But the immune system also detects and destroys cancerous cells in our body, protecting us from cancer. And the immune system is really important in promoting wound healing. But ultimately, the job of the immune system is to detect and destroy dangerous things. So how does it do that? And I like to think of this like a car. First, it needs to detect the dangerous thing, and it, it has to start the car. Next, its job is to eradicate the dangerous thing. And I think about that as the immune system pushing down the accelerator. That's kind of when you get a fever, that would be an example of the immune system at work. But when it's gotten rid of the dangerous thing, its job is to recover. It needs to stop and it needs to repair. And then the really amazing thing about our immune system is after it does this, it remembers. So when we think about immune diseases, these are diseases where one of these features is broken. So I'm gonna talk first about the diseases we've studied for a while, and then we'll talk about COVID-19. So BRI has been involved in studying autoimmune diseases throughout its uh, tenure as an immunology institute. There's over 110 autoimmune diseases. And these range from lupus to rheumatoid arthritis, type one diabetes, um, skin diseases like psoriasis. And in each case, the immune system has made a mistake and it's identified a healthy tissue and it's attacked it. It thinks it's dangerous when it's not. And this leads to all of these diseases. 
And all, there's so many autoimmune diseases that many times people don't understand what they are. But when you put them all together, one in 15 Americans has an autoimmune disease. That means someone in your life that you care about or yourself may have a disease. And why I think this is so important for us to study is these are chronic debilitating diseases and they have no cures. The other disease that we study is aller allergic disease. And this again is a place where the immune system has made a mistake and it hits the accelerator when there's nothing dangerous around. It's actually recognized something that's totally benign as dangerous. So when we think about allergies, actually 50 million Americans have allergies, 15 million have food allergies like severe peanut allergies, and 25 million Americans have asthma, which is an allergic type disease. So that means one in four Americans has an allergy or asthma. And I think really importantly, we think about how it affects children. And one in 13 children have an allergy. And if they were in class today, two in every classroom would have an allergy. The immune system is also important because we can harness it to improve our health. Um, and over the last several years, the ability to use the immune system as a form of cancer therapy has really become important and prominent. CAR T cells were developed in part uh, here in Seattle. Um, and there's a new type of drug called a checkpoint inhibitor. It's the drug that Jimmy Carter's been getting to treat his melanoma. And then, of course, one of the most important topics to all of us today is the role of vaccines. And in fact, vaccines have been one of the major sources uh, supporting human health uh, in the last century. Their job is to prevent infection and also prevent bad outcomes once someone does get infected. And we'll be talking briefly about the COVID-19 vaccine tonight. So at BRI, the way we do our work, as I said, it's a very collaborative, integrated approach, is that we start with the fundamentals. And we have investigators at BRI who study the basic fundamentals of how the immune system works. But they don't stop there. Once they make a discovery, we're able to go and look into patient samples. And we work closely with patients and doctors to identify important questions where we can apply our knowledge. We take samples and we take them into the laboratory and really define what the immune system looks like in a healthy person or someone with an autoimmune or allergic disease. And then what we learn from that helps guide the next clinical trial that gets done. We participate in clinical trials, but we also do something else. We don't just stop there because clinical trials can work. Sometimes they don't work. And a lot of times they work for some people, but not everybody. And that's where going back to the lab is so important. So we can learn from those trials about what works, why it, some treatments don't work, and we can identify the right patient to get the right therapy at the right time. And we continue this process so that we can always improve therapies and get to not only making people feel a little bit better, but ultimately our goal is to prevent or cure these diseases. So, I've been talking about allergies and autoimmunity, but I told her I was gonna talk about COVID-19. So why did BRI scientists start studying COVID-19? Um, and one reason is that we're experts in immunology, particularly human immunology. So we already had the tools in place to study this disease. We're also very agile. We're able to, we have the infrastructure built to study fundamental immunology as well as patient samples. We have the expertise and a very close clinical connection so we could do that. And as I said, we're collaborative and that allows us to develop work within our group to work quickly, but also we have a partnership with the physicians uh, and staff at Virginia Mason and that made it very uh, helpful for us as we moved forward in these studies. But importantly, we collaborate with other investigators throughout Seattle, the University of Washington, um, Seattle Children's, Fred Hutch, all of whom have been involved in important work. So I thought I'd talk about some of our questions that we wanted answered and maybe some of those are ones you'd like to understand too. So one of the first questions is, why do some people have mild and others have severe disease? Um, and this became very clear early in the pandemic that there were some people who did very poorly and others who really did quite well. And our goal was to use our studies of the immune system to see if we could predict who would get worse 
and when they would improve. We also want to understand if COVID-19 has long-term effects on health and immunity. And as we know, this is becoming an important question a year into this pandemic. And then, of course, we have a strong interest in all of the patients we've studied who have immune-mediated diseases, autoimmune diseases, allergies. Um, and so we want to understand if there's increased risk for those individuals if they get infected and get COVID-19. We also want to find ways to help treat and prevent severe disease in COVID-19. And, um, you know, we have questions about vaccination. How well does these vaccines work in everyone? And we'll touch on that a little bit. And then we have some fundamental questions trying to understand how this virus interacts with our cells to better, so that we could better intervene in COVID-19. So just a little bit about how you do these kind of studies. First, we start with a question, makes sense. Then we sit down and we write a protocol. We actually figure out not only what our question is, but how do we think we can answer it? We then go to the patients and the doctors, we get samples and bring them back to the laboratory where we're able to use the technology uh, available to study the immune system. And then ultimately we take that information and we analyze this data so that we can ultimately come up with answers to our questions. And I think the important thing is this is how we always do our work. Usually we do this in a matter of months and years. For our uh, COVID-19 work, we were able to mobilize and start doing this work at the end of March of 2020. So what did we do? Well, we worked with our colleagues at Virginia Mason who were seeing patients in the hospital and clinic with COVID-19. And we were able to collect samples from those individuals who were infected, um, particularly rescuing samples that were already drawn for their clinical care. We collected samples from patients who came to the clinic and were sick, but they were able to go home. Samples from patients in the hospital, and we really had two groups, the people who were critically ill in the intensive care unit on ventilators, and the group of patients who were in the hospital but didn't require intensive ther therapy. And for those individuals, we were able to get multiple blood samples over the time of their hospitalization. At the same time, we compared these patients to other people in the hospital so that we could understand what was different about a patient with COVID-19 who was critically ill and someone who may be in the hospital for another reason. So what did we learn? Uh, and the, one of the first questions my colleague Uma Malhotra asked was, who ends up in the hospital? Um, and could we de determine who these people were before they were so sick they needed to be there? And what she did is she looked at a whole group of patients who were seen as outpatients. That was the first 180 patients that we saw. And amongst that group, they all went home. But within that group, as you can see from my picture, some of them got worse and came back to see the doctor. And amongst those patients, 14 of them ended up in the hospital. So she went through with her colleagues and looked at the characteristics of the patients when they first showed up. And they found out that the people who ended up in the hospital, the first day they saw a doctor complained of being short of breath, they had low blood counts, and they also had a lot of underlying health problems. Now, some of that's not surprising, but I think it's important to know that these were real key indicators. So why does it matter? Well. If you are a person who has these features and the doctor knows about it, they probably want to keep a close eye on that individual. Maybe have them come back or have their family keep a closer eye. We know that some of the treatments for COVID-19 really work earlier and that the people we would want to give them to are the people who are going to get sickest. So this is a way to help us choose those therapies. And then ultimately, if you have a high-risk person you need to make sure they get to the hospital when they need to get to the hospital. It may not have been the time they showed up at the beginning, but we know too many people have stayed home for too long. So this type of information is really important. So then we want to talk, we learned quite a bit about the patients that were hospitalized. And so I already described to you that we had a group of patients, people who were not critically ill and people who became critically ill. 
And we took their samples and literally the same day they were drawn, we took them to the laboratory and then we studied those samples uh, in real time so that we could get data on these samples. And after the first three months, we looked at 60 patients um, and were able to identify some characteristics of these patients that were really different about their immune system. And so I'm gonna challenge you because on the right side of this slide, I have what we call a heat map. And I think if you look at the pattern on the heat map, you can really see three groups. I've kind of helped you because I put the black dotted lines there. It helped me. And I have the arrows and you can see the green and orange arrows are pointing to two groups. And those are the people who actually had the mild, milder cases um, and did well. And then the red arrow is pointed to about half of the patients and they look really different. In fact, they're all blue down there except for one red bar on the left. And those were the patients who overall became critically ill and were in the intensive care unit. This is what we call an immune signature. And these immune signatures tell us about what is going on in the immune system in these individuals. And it helps us get an idea of how we might wanna treat the patients who are most critically ill. And importantly, this data that I'm showing you was on the day they arrived in the hospital. So irrespective of how sick they were that day, the signature that we saw predicted who, what would happen to them. So, we wanted to understand, because we were able to look at these patients over time, what happens when this disease starts. The acceleration is what we think is where the problem is in patients with severe COVID-19. Their immune system runs out of control, making them very, very sick. But we wanted to understand that trajectory over time as it starts, accelerates, recovers, and remembers. And so because we had samples that we followed over time, we were able to look at the patients who were stable, the patients who became severely ill, and then amongst those who were quite ill who recovered, we were able to see what happened. And I have two figures here just to explain that, showing two of the many cell populations we studied. The blue line is the people who did well. And when we looked at that as immunologists, we could say, that's what we would expect if someone had a viral infection. They accelerated, they eliminated the virus, and then they recovered. It was a normal looking response. But in red, you see the lines are different from the blue lines, and those are the critically ill patients. So not just at the first day they came to the hospital, but throughout their hospitalization, their immune system was behaving very differently. And in fact, wasn't responding the way we expected to, and was having trouble with that recovery stage. So by doing this, we've been able to look at patterns about the patients and using the immune system to predict their outcome. That helps allocate hospital resources, customize treatments for patients, identify new mechanisms that protect from disease and new ways to treat the disease. And one thing about this work that I think was so important is that we were able to start it in at the first uh, day of April we were able to do our analysis in June of 2020. We made this data public in a, what we call a white paper um, in August of 2020. So it was available to all the, P the scientific community and it was published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation last month as a peer reviewed paper. So I'm just gonna end with what are we doing about this whole vaccine question and the question of immune memory. And of course, many people are asking questions about how well the vaccine works, um, side effects of the vaccine, but we felt that it was really important at BRI for us to ask the question about how this vaccine is working in our patients with autoimmunity, both to understand if their underlying diseases impact their ability to respond to this vaccine, but also because they're on immunosuppressive drugs, how well does the vaccine work in that setting? So when the vaccine first became available in, in Seattle in December, we began recruiting patients and healthy subjects so we could understand looking at samples before their vaccine and following them over the next year with vaccination to understand do they have a strong immune response, a weak immune response, and then in the case of autoimmune diseases, do they have adverse effects from the vaccine that we aren't aware of? Now I'm putting this out there because this is an important question we don't know the answers to yet. We've just started that work. 
um, and we can take questions later. I will say we are advising our patients with autoimmunity to take the vaccine. We think it's very important and will protect them, but we want to make sure that we follow up uh, and, and study this uh, for the long term. So I'm going to finish there, and I'm going to hand the baton over to my colleague, Adam Lacey Holbert. He's one of the principal investigators at the Benaroya Research Institute um, and an expert in uh, fundamental immunology. And I'm going to let him tell you about some of the discoveries we've made at BRI this year. Thank you, Jane. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Lacey Holbert. As Jane said, I'm a, an investigator at the Benaroya Research Institute. I work really on fundamental mechanisms of the immune response. And what I'm going to tell you about today is a, um, a couple of these fundamental um, immunology stories that we've um, that, that we put, put together from our COVID-19 work at the Benaroya Research Institute. So what I'm going to start with is a um, just a brief overview of, of SARS-CoV-2, COVID, and the immune system. Um, as Jane mentioned earlier, I think you know, almost everyone has a lot more knowledge of immunology and infectious disease than they did a year ago. But just to recap on, on, on how the virus works and how the immune system works, as you know, um, SARS-CoV-2 is what we call a respiratory virus. It infects the airways. And so the first thing the virus does is to get into the airway and begin to infect the airway cells. Um, that's the infection part. The bit that we as immunologists are really excited about is the immune response. This is what happens next. The body detects the infection and then it mounts an immune response. And many of these different immune cell types come together to dissect the virus, uh, present it back to each other, and generate an effective immune response. And this can come in different flavors. Um, there are cells called T cells, whose job really is to go back into the tissue and find the infected cells and kill them. And then there are cells called B cells, which make antibodies. And these antibodies go back into the tissue and bind directly to the virus and stop the virus from infecting the next round of cells. So this combined immune response together is what neutralizes the virus. But as Jane mentioned, what happens uh, in some individuals when they get SARS-CoV-2 infection is that actually the immune response um, overreacts to the infection. The, the lung and other, and other tissues, other organs, can get overwhelmed with immune cells, with T cells and B cells and other cells that generate inflammation in those organs, and that can then cause tissue damage. And it's really the lung damage and the other organ damage, this, this overactive immune response that's responsible for the severe COVID-19 uh, that, that, that so many people have suffered from. So some of the questions that I had as, a, as an immunologist really were, you know, what is actually happening to the immune system in COVID-19? You know, and particularly, why is it overreacting and why is it attacking, over attacking the tissues rather than just neutralizing the virus and restoring things to normal? So one of the ways in which we approached this was, was really using very similar approaches to the ones that Jane talked about a few minutes ago. Um, we were able to use part of that clinical study that we've set up with uh, the um, physicians at Virginia Mason. And we were able to um, get access to, to healthy people, uh, to people who were in the hospital sick with COVID but not requiring intensive care treatment, and then those people who developed severe COVID-19. And we were able to get blood samples from those patients. And then we were able to use a new assay system that we've been um, adopting at Benaroya Research Institute. And this is a way in which we can actually stimulate the immune cells in the blood to understand how they are reacting to an in, in infection. So what we do is take the blood cells and we give them extracts of bacteria or extracts of viruses or we might expose them to some of the signals that the immune system normally uses to accelerate the immune response. And then we would take the blood and we would look at the expression, the levels of expression of all of the genes in all of those immune cells. So this is many tens of thousands of genes. And we can look at, by looking at those genes, we can understand how the cells are responding to those different um, types of stimulation, those different types of infection. 
And what we really wanted to know was what is changing and how those cells are responding during severe COVID-19. And what we found was really quite striking. Um, what we found firstly was that in, in patients with moderate, but particularly patients with severe COVID-19, there was an increase in this inflammatory response, the sort of response you normally get to um, a wound or an infection. And that was something that we kind of expected to see because we knew that the patients with severe COVID-19 had um, this inflammation in their lungs. But what was surprising to us was that another, another arm of the immune response, this, this response that is normally turned on to combat virus infection, was actually reduced in many of the patients with severe COVID-19. And this was counterintuitive to us. The patients have a virus infection, yet they're actually turning off the immune response to um, the virus. And we think that this actually may help to explain why uh, some of these people are getting um, severe disease. So our work is continuing uh, in that area, trying to, to understand how this antiviral response gets turned, turned off in severe COVID-19. So looking at this, we think that perhaps, you know, obviously um, the disease is being caused by this overactive immune response. And uh, since the beginning of um, the COVID-19 um, outbreak, we've been using uh, various different drugs to try to suppress this overactive immune response. And some of those drugs have been trialed uh, at Virginia Mason and, and, and many other places. And what was very interesting to us is that many of those drugs actually are drugs that we also use in the context of autoimmune disease to try to, to put the brakes on the immune system. But what we now realize is that there may be a need to marry those drugs with others that will go in and actually help to boost this antiviral response and potentially, potentially help uh, to remove that virus very early on in the infection. So that's one of the projects that we've been doing uh, in the lab to try to understand the um, disease. The other was really trying to sort of take, a, take an earlier step. So actually, are there ways in which we can help to prevent infection in the first place? So this really means that we have to focus on the cells in the airway. These are the, the main targets of the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. And can we, the, the questions we really had are, you know, these are, the, these are the cells that are the first target of viral infection. And what we don't really understand fully is, how do these layers of cells actually protect our entire body? So the question that we had going into this is, can we find ways to make these cells defend themselves better against the virus? So the way we use this is um, a very powerful system that we use in the lab. This is a system called a genetic screen. What we do is we take, we take airway cells that have been isolated from people and we grow them in dishes in the lab. And then we use this clever genetic trick that we have where we can treat those cells and we can turn on, in every cell, we can randomly turn on one gene, maybe randomly turn off another gene, so that what you end up with is dishes full of cells that all look a little bit different from each other. Some of them have these genes turned on, some of them have other genes turned off. I've represented those in the slide with, with the cells all becoming different colors. And then we infect those cells with the virus that we're interested in. And that virus normally infects the cells and kills them. But some of those cells, because of the genes they have turned on or turned off, become resistant to infection with the virus. And those cells survive when you put the virus in the dishes. And then they grow and divide. And then we can isolate those cells. And we put them through a DNA sequencer. And we say, what genes are different in these cells that were able to resist the infection from the cells that couldn't? And that enables us to find you know, new genes and new pathways that are involved in the defense mechanism against virus infection in these cells. Now, the, that's the first part of the approach. The difficult part then really starts for us as scientists where we have to look at those genes and pathways and say, well, what are they actually doing? Can we, can we map them onto the normal virus infection cycle? And can we understand what they're doing so then maybe we can um, use those approaches uh, to try to combat infection. And what I want to tell you about now is just one of those particular genes that we identified and just give you a brief um, idea about where that, where that gene actually works. 
So to take a step into the, the basic science behind this, this is the virus infection cycle. The first thing the virus particle has to do is to get into the cell, and it actually does that in two steps. The first thing it does is to bind to the surface of the cell. This is actually where the spike protein that you may have heard about comes into, comes into its own. This is the, the green protein on the surface of this little virus particle, and it binds to a, a receptor protein on the surface of a cell, and it gets itself internalized into the cell. But then a second really important step has to happen. All of the important part of the virus, all of the genetic code of the virus, is encompassed inside a lipid um, shell. And the cell itself is, is protected by another lipid, another lipid layer. And those layers have to fuse together so that the virus can deliver its genetic material into the cell. That process is called fusion. Now, once fusion happens, the virus uh, genome, the DNA or RNA of the virus, this squiggly line in the picture here, is inside the cell. It then fools the cell into making all of the virus proteins, and then the cell assembles those proteins together into new virus particles, and those then get released to repeat the whole infection cycle all over again. So, for a cell to stop a virus from infecting it, it has to intervene at one of these points and block one part of this process. And what we discovered in our screen was a particular gene. This gene is called C2TA. It's, the name is not particularly important. What we discovered is that this gene, when it's turned on in cells, actually blocks this fusion process that I told you about. And the way that we were able to really work this out was actually quite, it was quite dramatic, it was quite exciting for us. We were a little stuck on what was happening, and in the end, we decided to take a picture of the cell. Now, to take a picture of a, a cell being infected by a virus, you need a microscope, a very powerful microscope. In this case, we used an electron microscope. And these are a couple of the actual pictures that we took on our electron um, microscope. The, the top couple of images are the cells, the, the normal cells, we call those the control cells. Um, on the left is a, is a lower power magnification, but if you focus on the, the picture at the top right, what you can see with a little black arrow is a, is a bullet-shaped particle. That's the virus particle inside the cell. You'll see that it's inside a little bubble, and that virus actually is in the process of fusing with that bubble, and it will put its DNA then into the, the large gray mass that surrounds. That's actually the body of the cell. So that virus is in the process of fusing. Now, in the bottom two images, you will see pictures of cells that have been infected. These cells have turned on this gene, C2TA. And what you will see in the panel in the bottom right actually is that that cell has many of these little virus particles in it. And the reason it has so many is those viruses can, those viruses can get into the cell but they can't fuse, they're stuck. And in fact, you can see in the red arrows, they get stuck inside their own little mini bubbles. The cell is able to trap those viruses inside those little bubbles. And it's a dead end for the virus, it can't go any further. So this was really very exciting to us, and uh, this is just one of the genes that we found in this, in this particular screen process. And, and we have more, um, more work to do to work out more parts of that particular pathway. Um, it was very exciting for us because we'd actually discovered a new mechanism by which cells are able to resist infection by viruses. Um, this affected several viruses. We actually started this study working on a different pandemic virus, working on Ebola virus. Uh, and then we finished the study last year working on SARS-CoV-2. So we'd actually encompassed a couple of pandemics in a single study. Um, but what was exciting was that, that that mechanism was actually able to work against several of those viruses. We discovered a new role for an old gene, actually. C2TA is something that we've known about in the immune system for quite a long time, but we never realized that it had this particular role in defending cells against virus um, infection. And we were actually able to prove that we can use this approach to find genes involved in these processes. And we're repeating this approach now with, with more screens, with more viruses, to find more of these new mechanisms. And of course, ultimately, what we're interested in is trying to take some of these fundamental um, findings and try to translate them into some form of treatment or therapy. I think our, our goal, our long-term goal, 
Um, it might not be here for SARS-CoV-2, but it might be for the next um, pandemic, is to try to find ways in which we could turn these pathways on easily and maybe make people um, better able to defend themselves against viruses when we know uh, that there is a, a, a heightened chance of that. So I hope what I've given you is um, some overview of some of the research that we're doing uh, and trying to understand you know, ways in which we might be able to develop new uh, therapies and approaches to combat viral diseases such as COVID-19, um, either by suppressing the inflammatory response uh, that, that causes the damage, maybe boosting the antiviral response to uh, increase our ability to clear the virus, or actually ways in which we could prevent infection in the first place. Now, we mentioned vaccines. I just want to show you in this, in this scheme, well, where do vaccines fit in? Uh, and just to, just to give you a quick bit of background on vaccines. Um, many of you would have heard about the mRNA vaccines. These are new uh, vaccines that have really first been used as vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. Um, these are the vaccines developed by Pfizer and BioNTech and the other vaccine developed by Moderna. I'll give you a quick idea about how these vaccines work. So these are um, essentially the, the, the vaccine relies on uh, using the genetic code that codes for that virus spike protein that I told you about earlier. So we take the, the RNA sequence, so the genetic code for that spike protein, we encapsulate it in uh, a nanoparticle that's able to get into an immune cell. So that is the vaccine. When you inject that vaccine, it gets taken up by the immune cells. The immune cells then look at that genetic code and use it to make their own copies of the spike protein which they display on their surface. And then the other immune cells come in, recognize that, and make antibodies or T cells that respond to that spike protein. So in our model of the infection, the virus really, the vaccine really comes into the middle there. The vaccine is able to come in and stimulate the immune response without the need for that initial infection process. We then get a protective immune response that's able to go back in to the lungs and the airways when you get an infection and neutralize the virus. But the great thing about the vaccine that is, is that it doesn't seem to uh, generate that, that overactive immune response that damages tissues. So as Jane mentioned, one of the things that we'll be studying at BRI in clinical trials is really you know, un understanding how the immune response to the vaccine is different from the sorts of immune responses that we've been seeing uh, in COVID-19. So just to come back to our original question, you know, why do we study COVID-19 at the Benaroya Research Institute? And I think what I'd like you to, to take away from this is that we've really learned about three different things. We've learned about COVID-19. We've learned about who gets severe disease, uh, who recovers, and why that might be happening. Um, we've learned a lot about the immune system and the immune response to viruses. We've learned about how viruses disrupt the immune response, how vaccines cause immunity. We've learned about new defense pathways against virus infection. And lastly, we've learned about autoimmune disease, which is the thing that really you know, drives research at the Benaroya Research Institute. We've got a lot of new insights into uh, immune organ damage, lung damage, and other sites. Uh, many of the pathways that are disrupted in COVID-19 are actually also disrupted in autoimmune disease. And we're seeing a lot of parallels there between, between virus infection and autoimmunity. And we've also been able to use this as an opportunity to develop and test new tools to profile the immune response, which we're now deploying uh, in autoimmune disease. So that's the end of my presentation. I will hand back to Jane. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. And so now that we've talked a little bit about BRI and, and the work in COVID-19, we wanted to spend some time answering questions from our virtual audience. And we already have a few questions that were uh, written in, but please feel free to send more questions. And there's a really astute question that I am going to ask Adam. Uh, and this question is, to what extent might your findings be different if other strains of COVID-19 were active in Seattle? Are your, uh, is your work generalizable? Are you partnering uh, with other groups to do parallel studies elsewhere? 
So I think that's a really good question. Um, I think there are several <laughs> answers to that. I mean, I think that some of the work that we've been doing, I think as I, as I summarized um, with the work with the genetic screens, many of the pathways that we're finding there are mechanisms that actually act host, you know, our own body mechanisms that act against many viruses. So we would actually hope that um, a lot of the findings that we're finding there um, actually will, will be applicable, not just against other strains of um, SARS-CoV-2, but also against um, other viruses too. Yeah, and I would add, I think this is a great question, and it's important to think about one of the things very early on our colleagues noted some of the differences between the COVID-19 virus in Seattle and those that were uh, found on the East Coast. Um, one group came from China, the other came from Italy. Um, and as you know, there's more emerging variants. That's what we expect viruses to do. Um, and I think being very cognizant of the different viruses is important as and is integrated into the work we do. And I think also partnering with other, other groups has been very important uh, for us as well. So, Someone asked one of my favorite questions, and that is, is there a relationship between the immune system and aging, um, and also asking about anti-aging research? And granted, this is a question that's come up um, in the last year for many people because um, older age has put people at greater risk for severe COVID-19. But it's certainly been an important question, and, and, and we are very interested in understanding how the immune system changes with age. From birth, when children are um, actually at higher risk for getting allergies, and of course some of the autoimmune diseases we study, like type 1 diabetes, tend to occur more often in the young. But we see many diseases that develop in, in later life, and, and we see changes in the immune system with that. One of the ways I think about it with aging is that um, you, have a, you develop all this immune memory, but you aren't able to make new memories as well as you get older. So we know that from, what, from studying other infections, and so that is, is a concern in the setting of um, in viral infections. The other thing is I talked about that starting and stopping. And I think as people age, it's harder for the immune system know, to know when to stop. And that's why we see more inflammatory diseases like cardiovascular disease, um, as well as autoimmune diseases. So currently we are trying to study um, the aging immune system at BRI. We actually have a study of healthy individuals who are young and healthy individuals who are older, and we're actually doing a very targeted study to compare them um, and try to understand, in fact, what happens as the immune system ages and what may drive that process more quickly in some individuals. Um, so a, a question, uh, one of the questions that has come up is, was a question about a specific autoimmune or inflammatory disease called PMR, and whether there's been increase in that diagnosis uh, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Again, a question that I find intriguing, and not just that disease, but in fact, all of the autoimmune diseases um, were very interested in understanding how this uh, pandemic um, has affected individuals with autoimmunity. We don't know yet if there's been a change and we need to follow that up. Um, I, I'm working with the group at TrialNet to do that, looking at children at risk for type one diabetes to understand if the rate of diabetes has changed in the last year. We're asking those questions in uh, other, other areas as well, uh, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, for example. We don't know the answer yet, but we're starting to ask those questions because I think it's really important to understand if infection with a virus can trigger that. And for many years, we thought viruses may trigger autoimmunity. Now we actually have a virus that's infected many, many people all at the same time. So we can ask that question and hopefully I'll be able to come back and answer that in a year from now. And um, there's actually a specific question. There's a lot of questions. I'm <laughs> so I'm going to have to pause for one second. Um, there's a question about our assays in patients who are asymptomatic for SARS-CoV-2. 
and, and what would happen? And, and I, again, think that's a fabulous question. During our initial studies, we were unable to look at that question um, because we weren't widely testing people for the virus. And so we weren't able to get that control group of people who tested positive but didn't feel ill. Um, I think that we'll be able to address that question down the road, and we will be able to also look using antibody studies to understand who actually had the infection but didn't know it and see if that changed their immune system. I apologize for my inability to read all of your questions quickly. Um, There's a question about rheumatoid arthritis and if there's research being done along with DNA for RA. So I, I'm, I think the question there is uh, whether we're studying, there's a couple of ways that we can interpret that question. Are people studying the genetics of rheumatoid arthritis? Absolutely. Are we thinking about developing uh, vaccines for rheumatoid arthritis? In fact, people are thinking about that, but they would be different than this current vaccine. So one of the questions that I think is really important is, do people with autoimmune diseases get the same antibody production response as a typical person? And that's a question we're going to ask as well as others. Um, in fact, we're working with the University of Washington to collect samples from our patients who have autoimmune diseases before and after they get the, their uh, vaccination and we'll measure their antibodies. And I think it's important to see how they do with their antibodies, but we're also gonna be studying other aspects of their immune response to that vaccine because there's more than just antibodies out there to protect you. And um, so that's work that's being done. And I know it, other groups are doing that around the world. So I wanted to pose a question for Adam, which was really to ask, so what about these new variants and how should we think about them? That's a good question and a timely question, Jane. Um, there's a lot of press, even recently just this week, about the new, the new variants that are out there and, and, and what we should be, whether we should be worried about them or not. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that these viruses do change. They mutate and new variants are to be expected. Uh, and, you know, we will, we will get new, new variants just as infections go on. Um, some of the variants do have different properties. You would, have, you would have heard about this in the news. Some of them are more infectious. Some of them uh, may cause slightly more severe disease in certain, certain people. Some of them are reported to um, partially escape from the um, antibodies. As scientists, it's really our job to look at those new variants and think about many of those worst case scenarios about you know how how bad could these variants be? Um, and we do many studies to try to understand how the variants are changing. Um, I think that the data that seems to be out there is that most of these, most of these variants uh, can be combated by the antibodies. The studies that have come out of Israel say that the antibodies, that the, the vaccines are still effective against these variants. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important thing for us to remember. You know, I think the, the vaccines are effective against the variants. Yeah. It's important to know that we, the good news is that we have vaccines, um, and obviously we need to keep an eye on all, all the different the changes. But um, I think we should feel really good about having having some light at the end of the tunnel there. A, a question about previous healthy people who get long COVID symptoms and are ill for a long time and a question about what's going on with that and as a long-term illness. And so as you're probably all aware, this long COVID is people who were healthy and got COVID-19 and, and don't seem to fully recover. And this is a really important question for us. And it it's really gets to the basic understanding of what a healthy immune system looks like and if we look at these individuals who had healthy immune systems before they got COVID-19, has their immune system changed? And we are very actively engaged in asking that question, um, uh, as is the National Institute of Health has just uh, established a, a, a grant to support research institutions to ask those questions. 
We don't know yet if the infection has actually changed the immune system so that now it's acting more inflammatory. Um, or the other thing that's been seen with COVID-19 is quite a few what we call autoantibodies. Those are antibodies that attack healthy tissue. We see these in autoimmune diseases. So the question is, are we now seeing a new kind of autoimmune disease that's been triggered by COVID-19? And again, more research needs to be done. People are actively asking questions about that. You know, there's a question about, and I think there's a couple of questions about what can we take from these studies and will it help us understand autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or type one diabetes? And I think Adam really made that point very clearly that some of the things we're learning by doing this is that we can understand how the immune system responds when it's stressed. And does that tell us something about what happens in people who get autoimmunity? Does it tell us something about how viruses might trigger autoimmunity? And that's something that's been studied for years, particularly in type one diabetes. Um, and then we've developed new tools and new insights about the immune system that now we can take and apply to autoimmune diseases. So COVID-19 has actually pushed us as scientists to use new tools, ask different questions, and that's gonna enlighten our future research. I, oh. <laughs> um, do you have thoughts about that, Adam? I think that's very, very true. I mean, I think, I, as I tried to say in the talk, I, I think that all those things are true. I think for me, it's been, for my lab particularly, it's, 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 it's been um, an opportunity to really develop some of these new tools. I mean, it's given us a, um, a need to understand things about the immune system that we weren't able to measure before. You know, some, sometimes you have these you have these pressing questions, and you have to develop new ways to answer those questions. And I think that that COVID nineteen, the emergence of that, has given us the that push really to to get some of those um, new methods out there and working on samples because there's been a need, a real pressing need to do that. And I'm very excited now about using some of those methods, uh, bringing them back to autoimmune disease. Another set of questions that people are asking are again about people, people who have um, immune diseases like interstitial lung disease um, or other diseases where they're on immunosuppressive medications. Um, things like uh, Humira, um, hydroxychloroquine, although that's not very immunosuppressive. Um, and what is, what's the risk of contracting COVID-19 and then how do people respond? And this is something that the community of physicians has been watching really closely over the last year. And one of the things we know is obviously if people have underlying health conditions, we do worry about them more and ask them to really be quite careful. But overall, what we've seen in our patients who are on these immunosuppressive drugs is that they've done really quite well. In fact, many of these drugs have been used in the most critically ill patients to control that inflammation that's causing so much trouble. So with, the, with individuals who have underlying uh, immune diseases and are on immunosuppressive drugs, we ask them to take special care um, to try to avoid infection. Uh, but we, we do think that they, they can do quite well. Now, I know concerns about lung disease, of course, in the setting of, a dis of an infection that causes pneumonia would raise even higher concerns. So one always has to think about uh, where that is. There's a question about hydroxychloroquine, and, and it's a drug I use all the time in rheumatology, and, and it's, a, it's an excellent drug uh, for diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and of course, early on in the pandemic, people became quite interested that it might be a way to treat COVID-19. And I think those ideas were actually quite intriguing. However, we've studied it quite intensely over the last year, and to date, it hasn't been shown to be helpful. So my patients on hydroxychloroquine for their autoimmune diseases absolutely need to stay on it, um, but we aren't recommending using that to treat or prevent COVID-19. All right. I'm just going to check one more time. I'm sorry if I missed any of your questions. There's a good number of them. Uh, 
Um, you know, I think one of the questions that we should probably address is the whole question, if you have an autoimmune disease, should you get vaccinated? Um, and I brought that up as a question where we're asking about what vaccines, how well they work in people with autoimmunity, if there's any side effects. But as I mentioned before uh, in my talk, we do think and recommend that patients with autoimmune diseases, for the most part, um, always talk to their physicians, of course, about this, but we are recommending generally that they get the vaccine because it's so important to be protected from this infection, and we, we believe it's quite safe. And I, I think really importantly, not only were the clinical trials done and showed safety in healthy individuals, some of those trials were done at BRI for the Pfizer vaccine, but also now we have a great experience of millions people of people a day being vaccinated uh, across a broad breadth of the population. And, and so far we aren't seeing any evidence that there are increased risks in, in the autoimmune population. So I'm certainly encouraging my patients to, to do that. You know, I have a question that, um, from someone about some of these diseases called auto-inflammatory diseases, things like familial Mediterranean fever um, and others. And, and this is a really interesting question. What about those patients? So I'll just give a, so other people can understand my answer. Auto-inflammatory diseases are genetic diseases where as like Adam has described, where there's something wrong with one gene and it tends to make the immune system hyperreactive. Um, either the starter gets turned on too quickly or they can't turn off their immune response. And so these individuals do tend to trigger a more severe response um, when they see any kind of inflammation. That's a group of patients who I'm currently unsure how best to treat them. Um, and I think the experts in this field, I am not particularly an expert in auto-inflammatory diseases. And I think we really need to look to those experts to help us understand um, concerns about uh, vaccination. One way we can help understand what works well is we can look at other vaccines that we use that trigger inflammation, um, things like the Shingrix vaccine uh, for shingles um, or the flu vaccine. And so if we've been able to use those vaccines in a person who has an auto-inflammatory disease, then I'd feel pretty good about using it. But that is definitely a place where one's physician will really be helpful because those are rare diseases and unique. Oh, so I have a question about someone who has a relative who was vaccinated and then was diagnosed with COVID after the fact. Um, how does that happen? Well, you know, these vaccines are really excellent, uh, but they don't protect everyone, particularly someone who may not make as strong a response. So it's unfortunate that there will be a few people who, are vac who have infection after vaccination, but I'm gonna ask Adam uh, if you have comments about someone in their 90s being vaccinated and getting COVID-19. I think you, you said the you said the important thing there, which is that the vaccines are really very good, um, and you know the, the, the numbers that are coming out of the, these are 95 percent effective. There will be some um, people in which the vaccine doesn't mount a strong enough response, and then people get infected. Um, the data from many of the studies that are coming out now, now that we have many millions of people being vaccinated, is that even in patients where the vaccines don't fully protect against in infection, they tend to protect against severe disease. So even people who have been vaccinated who do get infected, um, generally the disease is not as severe and not as, not as long, long lasting. So. Yeah, yeah, so, and I, I think that is one of the things that doesn't get talked about as much is that people who are vaccinated who get infected do better. And, and than they would have done if they hadn't been vaccinated because they have that little extra protection of their immune system. 
You know, I think that, you know, we've had a great set of questions. Um, there's a few questions about kind of personal specific issues, and I would recommend that you talk with your physician to get advice, uh, particularly about certain medications, uh, certain uh, work environments or, or other activities. Um, everybody's case is unique, and so I, I really would recommend you, you get advice from, from your physician. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, we've really been, it's been a pleasure to share our work with you. I again wish that I could see everyone in person. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the team here at Town Hall for helping us put this on. Um, and uh, I uh, hope you have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>